جنہیں آپ کو بتائیں کہ مشیر خزانہ ڈاکٹر عبد الحفیظ شیخ استنبول میں اسلامک اکنامکس پر بارہویں بین الاقوامی کانفرنس سے خطاب کر رہے ہیں آپ کو دکھاتے ہیں پروفیسر ڈاکٹر محمد بلوت ریکٹر آف استنبول سباحت انجرم یونیورسٹی لیڈیز اینڈ جنٹلمین السلام علیکم اینڈ گڈ آفٹرنون اٹ از انڈیڈ اے گریٹ پلیجر اینڈ این آنر فار می ٹو بی اے پارٹ آف دی اوپننگ سیریمنی آف دا ٹویلتھ انٹرنیشنل کانفرنس آن اسلامک اکنامکس اینڈ فائنینس آئی ووڈ لائک ٹو تھینک دی آرگنائزرس آف دس ایونٹ اسپیشلی ڈاکٹر محمد بلوت for inviting me to join this prestigious forum. I would also like to sincerely appreciate the efforts of the university for organizing a very well thought out program for this conference and for bringing together experts in the area of Islamic economic and finance from all over the world. Uh, this uh, event is happening in the backdrop of an unprecedented crisis related to the coronavirus. The whole world has been affected and according to the IMF, the global GDP is going to contract by 3 to 4 percent. We in Pakistan have also been affected and our GDP has taken a hit of about 3 percent. Also our exports and remittances have been adversely affected and industry and retail trade and manufacturing sectors have also suffered. We have tried to respond by offering an economic stimulus in which we have transferred cash into the hands of about 16 million families. At the same time we have tried to provide different ways of helping our businesses by giving them liquidity, subsidized loans and incentives so that the economic impacts are not as negative as they would be otherwise. I want to say that uh, it is a pleasure for me to, organ to be a part of an event that is being held in Turkey. Pakistan and Turkey enjoy a very cordial and special relations. These relationships cover the areas of politics and trade, commerce and above all an attachment of our people to each other's countries. We have still a lot of work to do to try and promote our business to business relationships and to try and galvanize our economies to work even better together in the future to improve the close relationship that already exists and to further deepen our relationship in trade and investment. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very confident that the knowledge and expertise shared in this forum will contribute significantly towards enhancing collective understanding and expanding the boundaries of our understanding and to benefit from the huge potential of Islamic finance to overcome the crisis we face and to stimulate sustainable economic growth. The development of Islamic finance in its present form can be traced back to the decade of the 60s. It is still relatively new as compared to conventional financial markets. However, it is growing rapidly and the extension beyond Muslim majority jurisdictions reflects its much wider acceptability as a viable alternate and complement to conventional finance. According to the Islamic Financial Services Board, the Stability Report 2019, the Islamic finance industry stands at US dollars 2.4 trillion. Moreover, Thomson Reuters Islamic Finance Development Report mentions that there are around 1,400 Islamic finance institutions across more than 60 countries. In addition, dedicated academic, legal, regulatory and supervisory institutions are providing a solid 
platform for development. The growth of Islamic banking and finance in Pakistan coincides with the global history of Islamic finance. We made attempts in the 1980s to bring the whole banking and financial system in conformity with Sharia principles. The pioneering works of the 80s, especially in legal and regulatory fronts, have been a source of guidance and inspiration for many countries that initiated Islamic finance. Islamic banking was relaunched at the start of this millennium since the attempt to transform the whole banking system during the 80s had limited success. This time the methodology was modified to allow both Islamic and conventional banks to coexist with customers having the option to do banking with the system of their preference. Ladies and gentlemen, it is with a great sense of achievement that I share with you that the new approach has worked very well. The base of the Islamic banking industry is growing and its share in the overall banking industry is also increasing. At present, the Islamic banking industry in Pakistan has 22 Islamic banking institutions which include five full-fledged Islamic banks and 17 conventional banks with Islamic banking branches. These institutions are providing a wide range of Sharia-compliant products and services through their network of around 3,250 branches in 120 districts across the country. In addition, conventional banks operate 1,375 Islamic banking windows. Overall, Islamic banking has a 15% share in terms of assets of the banking industry, while the share has reached nearly 17% in terms of deposits. This remarkable growth in Islamic banking reflects the combined efforts of the stakeholders on supply side, but it also represents the overwhelming demand for Islamic banking in the country. The State Bank of Pakistan, our central bank, has also played a re leading role in nurturing Islamic banking and placing it on a sound footing. Our comprehensive and multi-tiered Sharia compliance framework designed to ensure Sharia conformity of Islamic banks' operations is considered one of the best and our central bank has been voted thrice as the best central bank for promoting Islamic finance by the Islamic Finance News of RED Money Group, Malaysia in 2015, 17 and 18. The government of Pakistan believes in the potential of Islamic finance to contribute significantly towards economic development and we have included Islamic finance as an integral part of Pakistan's national financial inclusion strategy which targets both voluntary and involuntary financial exclusion. The national financial inclusion strategy complements the targets set forth in the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals of Poverty Reduction, Inclusive Economic Development and shared prosperity. In my view, Islamic finance is most relevant to the SDGs and the Global Development Agenda for 2015 to 30, which require extraordinary mobilization of resources for implementation. The risk and reward sharing embedded in Islamic financing modes not only has the potential to enhance the allocation of resources in the real sectors of the economy, but it also tends to become a good tool for wealth distribution. In the same way, the inherent advantage of the Islamic financial industry to fund projects on the basis of equitable participation and profit sharing between financiers and entrepreneurs enables it to increase provision of formal financial services to unserved 
and underserved sectors such as small and medium enterprises, agriculture, low-cost housing, and microfinance. Therefore, to increase the outreach of Islamic finance to priority sectors, Islamic banking institutions in Pakistan have been assigned indicative sectoral targets, especially for SMEs and agriculture. Affordable housing and its related infrastructure has become the special focus of our government in the backdrop of the coronavirus. This is primarily because of the sector's potential to create employment and its many backward linkages. This is an important development since the housing industry provides an, an attractive opportunity for Islamic banks. In fact, Islamic financing constitutes a major share of housing finance in Pakistan. On the other hand, to promote and utilize Islamic finance, the government of Pakistan has not only issued domestic sovereign sukuk, but has also floated four international sukuk worth US dollars 3.6 billion. Interestingly, all international sukuk were oversubscribed, indicating a lot of demand for Sharia compliant instruments in the international market. In view of Pakistan's experience, I would urge this forum to further explore the possibilities of using the instrument of sukuk to generate resources for development. I would also like to highlight the emerging trend of ethical and green sukuk in the global arena. We must all appreciate that the issuance of green sukuk by Indonesia and Malaysia is a very welcome pioneering step and that has opened up new vistas for investment by Islamic banks with the added advantage of environmental preservation. I would say that as the stakeholders in the growth of Islamic finance, we should all make collaborative efforts to introduce dynamic structures catering to the needs of both investors and market demand for Sharia compliant resources. Nevertheless, ladies and gentlemen, Islamic finance also has its deficits that need to be carefully worked on to ensure real, inclusive and sustainable development. Most importantly, the area of microfinance largely appears to have been ignored by the Islamic finance industry. To remove this gap, the industry needs to bring further innovation and sophistication in the products to meet the diverse needs of the microfinance sector. In this context, I would like to use this forum to emphasize the urgent need for joint collaborative research with a special focus on Islamic microfinance. Furthermore, recent developments in financial technology, fintech, have introduced new business models and solutions that have potential to contribute not only towards operational efficiency, but also in providing digital financial services to customers. Though fintech's penetration into Islamic finance is still in its early stages, the potential disruptions to traditional Islamic finance cannot be underestimated. We must therefore also work on integrating the new and emerging models with the principles of Islamic finance. I'm sure you would all agree that the deployment of fintech cannot be more urgent than in the present situation of the COVID-19 pandemic. As such, the Islamic finance industry needs in a concerted way to address this very important issue. Ladies and gentlemen, as I draw towards a close, I would like to re-emphasize the need of increased collaborative research and development to capitalize on the inherent strengths of Islamic finance. Remarkably, Islamic finance offers a viable alternative to the debt-driven conventional banking infrastructure. For this purpose, the Islamic banking industry must strive to develop the capacity to tap the strategically important sectors and create value for their shareholders, depositors, 
and their country's economy as a whole. For example, by introducing innovative risk-sharing products and services rather than replicating conventional risk transfer products. Most importantly, Islamic finance institutions must develop synergies through cooperation, collaboration and partnerships across borders. It is equally critical for governments of Muslim states to promote and facilitate the efforts of Islamic financial institutions. This can be done, for example, through creating an enabling regulatory environment by consistent implementation of the Basel III and Islamic Financial Services Board frameworks. Number two, ensuring that systemic risks and dual banking systems that is conventional and Islamic are addressed. Three, implementing cross-border monitoring supervision and four, harmonizing Sharia governance through efforts to unify cross-country Sharia rulings about Islamic finance. In addition, high-quality experts are required for collaborative research and enhanced cooperation through knowledge sharing, exchange programs of faculty and students, and contributions in research journals of good standing would also be necessary. I therefore want to say that we must work together and coordinate closely to achieve the broader objectives of enhancing growth of the Islamic financial industry, both at the regional and a global level. I'm uh, looking forward to the recommendations that will emerge out of this prestigious forum. This is an event at a timely uh, occasion and I think uh, there is a need not only to come up with practical solutions but also to work together to implement them. Uh, once again I want to thank you for inviting me and I want to wish you all the best in your proceedings. مشیر خزانہ ڈاکٹر عبد الحفیظ شیخ کا اسلامی معاشیات سے متعلق بین الاقوامی کانفرنس سے خطاب آپ نے ملاحظہ کیا ان کا کہنا تھا کہ پاکستان میں اسلامی بینکنگ فروغ پا رہی ہے بجٹ بناتے وقت مشکل فیصلے کیے گئے کرونا وائرس سے پوری دنیا متاثر ہے اور اسی حوالے سے تھرڈ ورلڈ کنٹریز جو ترقی پذیر ممالک ہیں وہ بھی بہت بری طرح سے متاثر ہوئے ہیں